Okay, so I'm just going to get um, a quick presentation on TIP, um, which is basically um, a project that I've been working on for about the last six months or so. Um, so um, I'm basically going to give, tell you guys basically what TIM is. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and tell you how it sort of came about. Um, and we'll look at TIM's um, responsibilities and object model. We'll talk a little bit about how TIM interacts with Image Factory. Um, some, some very brief um, overview of the REST API. Um, and then we'll talk about extending TIM, essentially what I've already covered in the Rails guide actually. Um, and then basically uh, where we're going to go next. So this rather messy uh, paragraph is my attempt to sort of summarize TIM. So um, TIM is a Rails engine responsible for cloud image management. It allows clients to create, delete, and upload images to a multitude of cloud providers. TIM builds on top of Image Factory's cloud abstraction layer, adding the ability for clients to store metadata, which is searching, sorting, as well as versioning and support for access control. And TIM wraps all this up in a clean and simple RESTful API. So that's sort of um, my attempt to sort of define TIM in one paragraph. Um, so those of you who have worked on um, AOS for a while will recognize uh, this sort of um, architecture. And this is um, Image Factory's um, or conducted and Image Factory's um, previous interactions. So essentially we had um, Image Factory which talked to this um, Image Warehouse game component which is essentially um, key value store. Um, it used OS for creating images. Um, and they conducted with interact with Image Factory to kick off builds and to push images to particular providers. Um, and then also conducted with look with uh, look at image warehouse um, to check the status of those builds, to check any um, data like IDs for example. Um, and Image Factory would essentially use Image Warehouse Daemon um, as its object store. So, uh, so once it's finished uploading to a particular provider it basically push a lot of the, the image warehouse data which then conductor would then consume. And by the way, it looks to any of you guys like if you cut the little string connecting on Oz and Image Factory, it would drop a Postgres DB on somebody. That is actually true. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit of a root gold part machine. <laughs> uh, anyway. So, um, essentially this, this was the responsibilities um, shared between Image Factory and Image Warehouse team. And so, um, Image Factory was essentially tasked with building um, images for different cloud providers um, in different formats. Um, we're pushing those, um, those images to particular clouds. Um, it essentially um, understood um, some extra objects that weren't really essential to Image Factory, but that really were um, conductor ideas. Um, it supported um, important images. Um, it had uh, template and icicle resources um, that were stored as separate resources within um, Image Factory. Um, image Warehouse was essentially um, a blob store where the image actually was stored. Um, any metadata associated with those images uh, would be stored in Image Factory. Um, and it would also um, represent relations and associations between um, images and, 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 and any of these conductor specific um, objects such as uh, uh, builds um, and, and the top level image which um, had associated metadata that would, a user would define. Um, the original idea with Image Warehouse was that it would handle the pushing functionality um, and there would be some policy defined um, that would decide when would be a good time to push to a particular provider based on such as like things like bandwidth or, or whatever. Um, but actually never, that never happened. There was some basic functionality for EC2 but then it just got sort of dropped and Image Factory picked up the responsibility. So essentially one of the key features of the image warehouse um, that, that attracted us to using it was um, 
was actually implemented. So. Um, essentially, um, image warehouse causes, causes a lot of problems. So if you've been on iOS for a while, you can understand some of the problems that we are having. So, um, for example, the associations within the image factory, it was essentially a key value store. And the way our image factory used it, it meant that we only had associations in one direction, um, which meant that we had uh, thousands and thousands of requests just to list image metadata. So for example, if you wanted to list um, the, the uh, base image, the top level object of a provider image, you would have to iterate over every single um, object, object that led up to it. So for example, you'd have to iterate over all the target images for that, then you'd have to iterate over all the builds, and then you'd have to iterate all the, the images until you actually found um, the, the, the image that you were looking for. And I think um, me and Matty did some calculations at one point. Um, and something like, if you had 10 images, and 10 builds, and 10 target images, and 10 provider <coughs> images, we were doing something like 5,000 requests or something like that. It, it was something completely ridiculous, whatever yeah. it was. So, it, yeah, it, and it was a nightmare. Um, on top of that, um, Image Warehouse kept on crashing, and there was some issues with uh, MongoDB, which, um, which Image Warehouse used. Um, so we decided in the end that it wasn't really offering as much. It didn't do this build, it didn't do this push policy um, thing that we that was so hyped up about. And it was causing all these problems. So we basically went away um, and discussed removing it. There's quite a lot of politics involved, but we got there in the end. Um, and then we decided to come up with this sort of simpler architecture where we would use Tim to start with the metadata. Um, and Image Factory would essentially take on some of the responsibilities that Image Warehouse took on previously. So, for example, the, the image objects uh, storage. Um, Tim would handle um, anything that wasn't um, specific to Image Factory. So, the way that we went about this was we, we first decided that we would talk to the image factory folks and we would get rid of anything that wasn't, um, sorry, that basically anything that was outside of the scope of image factory. So any conducted um, specific objects that didn't really make sense but that were forced to squeeze in. Um, and we did any, the same thing for image warehouse. Um, so we decided to really focus on the core responsibilities of image factory. Um, and then once we've once we got those core responsibilities and we knew what factory was, was meant to do, then we decided that we would uh, pull Tim out and Tim would basically have to up uh, what was left over. So, um, a few things um, that were removed from factory, so for example, all these um, conductor specific concepts such as build, um, the top level image, the metadata. Um, they also revised their workflow, so the workflow is slightly different to what it was previously. Um, previously, um, we uh, Image Factory enforced the full family of objects. So we had a, an image, a build, the target image, a provider image for, for everything in Image Factory. But sometimes that didn't really make sense. For example, snapshot builds didn't really need a target image. But it was just the Image Factory essentially just kept the place over there because we needed it in conductor. Um, also, image importing that wasn't really um, that's not really essential to factory. We, we're not actually doing we're not actually importing an image. All we were doing is getting the idea of an, an existing image in a, in a cloud and storing it somewhere in um, in an image warehouse. But because we wanted to, because conductor wanted to use the same workflow, it went through image factory and then image factory had to implement this whole um, import functionality, which actually didn't make sense. Um, Template resource and um, icicle resource. These things are these things do still exist in um, Image Factory. So template is essentially the definition of the um, of the image, and icicle is the sort of existing definition of all the packages and stuff that are installed in that image. Um, so there's no there's no um, way to access those resources individually now in Image Factory, um, but they are they are stored underneath the covers. Um, and used by Image Factory itself. So, and also, um, we did quite a lot of work with Image Factory to try and create um, a reasonable REST API, uh, which was interesting. 
So we've got a slightly better REST API now, um, which is more usable than it was before. But it meant that we were going to have to do quite a lot of work uh, conduct aside in order to integrate um, with Image Factory to, in order to, to pick up all of these changes and also to interact with this new REST API. All right, everybody, watch yourself. We did it in the cloud or on the line. All right. <laughs> so, um, way to wrap me after you, thanks. We <laughs> better use some unvarnished, you know, feedback. What was that? I could have used some unvarnished feedback. So when do we get rid of the image factory? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so image factory is next to go. We've got a Rails engine for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so <laughs> I'm probably going to get a hard time now. Um, so, so, so these guys can correct me if I'm wrong here, but essentially um, the Image Factory uh, resource model has been flattened now. We don't have this um, this build uh, concept that I was talking about. We've been able to use essentially up three um, objects, a so base image, target image, and provider image. Um, all of these objects are immutable. So, and I'll get to this in a second, but essentially, once factory is told us what this object's going to look like, we can we know that that's not going to change. And if it does change, factory will tell us it's going to change um, through uh, webhooks. <coughs> and callback support. So this morning we were talking about um, adding hooks to our API, um, and this is one of the things that factory does. Factory does as well, by the way. I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so we use webhooks um, to do callbacks. So for example, like it takes quite a long time to create a target image. So we essentially register um, an endpoint um, when we create the request to create a target image. Um, and once the, um, the job's done, once um, Image Factory is finished creating the target image, it will then do a put to the endpoint that we've, that we've given it, and that will update, um, and that will essentially put the whole target image object um, to that resource URL. So, so what happens in Tim is that we have um, a REST API um, that accepts the image factory data and this will be put to that REST API and then we'll update the object inside Tim. And because the objects are immutable, we know that it's not going to change, so we know that the data is up to date. Is there a timeout sort of function? Like, let's say that you know, you're creating the XYZ thing. Yeah, we did the yeah. process path. So we've, we've, we've spoken here? about this, yeah, um, and it's uh, not been implemented yet as far as I'm aware. Can webhooks do it? Because I'm just thinking if we was to use webhooks for, let's say, the hooks type stuff, it's being discussed for the some of those people that need hooks for, like, you know, let's say approvals or whatever, they're going to yeah. need some sort of timeout type thing in case. Yeah, so, yeah, I guess it's just it's just a, a fact of, you know, just retry doing, doing the port. Okay, cool, so yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it's not implemented at the moment, yeah. Um, so that said, so given that, um, you know, we've whittled down factory's responsibilities to just those, to just their, their core, um, that leaves um, Tim with a number of responsibilities, a number of things that we need to, to handle now that we've removed an um, image warehouse. So um, one thing is we need to offer a template store where users can store templates and then build images based on those templates at a later date. Um, we want to add versioning, so essentially the build <coughs> project that we removed um, was kind of like a version in the sense that it sort of guaranteed, or was meant to guarantee that any target images built um, from that build would be equivalent. Um, any custom data that we need to conduct there is now stored in TIM, or it can, it can be stored in TIM through extensions. And we also need to handle image imports, um, any error reporting, status reporting, um, and metadata store, I guess that's the same as custom data really. Um, but yeah, any any user data that needs to be stored on an image would be would be stored in Tim. Um, so when we um, when we decided that we were going to uh, create Tim, we really wanted to avoid um, some of the problems that we had with Image Warehouse. Um, so 
like our focus really was um, making this thing um, really easy to use and um, really natural. Um, um, and we did that by uh, we wanted to create a consistent workflow. So like I said, in factory, the workflow um, isn't necessarily consistent depending on, for example, if you want to create um, a target image. Uh, so if you want to create a provider image that is of a snapshot type, it doesn't have a target image object because it's needed. But we wanted to hide that um, and create a consistent workflow. So um, we hide this um, into. We wanted to create a clean REST API, um, one that doesn't take five thousand requests to uh, list data on an object, um, and a clean object model. I'm not sure what I meant by clean object model, but essentially we we only store um, the essentials um, in Tim. So the other thing, um, like I said, image warehouse. Um, was forever third on Mama's MongoDB was crashing quite a lot. You'd have to go in and manually um, remove um, any MongoDB data and stuff, and it was just basically pain in the ass. So um, one one of the good things about creating a Rails engine is that you have you know essentially two less services to to worry about because it runs inside the host application. Um, it shares um, the same database, so there's no requests between. You know, conductor and what used to be image warehouse. Now everything's stored in the same database, so you don't have that overhead. Um, and we really wanted to do everything the Rails way, so we stuck to the Rails guide, basically by letter, um, and um, essentially created Tim in that way. We we have um, done things in the past where we decided not to do some, something the Rails way or the Rails recommended way. And it, it seemed to work up until a point, and then you just get yourself into this absolute mess because um, Rails expects you to do one particular thing, and you're not doing it. Um, so yeah, we basically stuck to the letter of the law. Um, <coughs> one thing that we've been talking about as well is like upstream interest. Um, we actually think that Tim can be used um, in other projects um, for, for essentially image management. Um, so, for example, um, in the OpenStack project, you were talking about that you don't really have any image uh, building functionality. So, it's yeah, there's no, there's no tool yeah. on where or off the device, and this will be actually just the image store. Also, I'll point out that um, uh, I've been speaking to Ohad, who runs the, the maintainer for the foreman, yeah. and he needs, when he wants to provision a machine in a vertical, Space, he needs a way to build the juice that he will install stuff on top of. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and in that reasonable way, um, that's the use case, would Tim still depend on image factory or would that be a local component? Uh, so the initial um, idea with Tim was that it was, it was meant to be sort of um, agnostic. So you, the idea would be that you could swap in and out back ends. Um, Um, it, I mean, it is possible, yeah. but um, as far as, um, I mean, maybe that could be an upstream thing, but as far as conductors concerned, we're not really, you know, we're stuck with image factory, so um, that's the way it's going to be implemented. Essentially, if this, this gains some popularity and people want to use, for example, box grinder, you could rip the back end down and replace it reasonably easily. I'll, I'll just, I'll show you in a minute essentially how we do the image factory interaction, and that can be pulled out. So. Box Grinder runs on OS X? I don't know, it's really pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Dimitri, you know if Box Grinder runs on OS X? The what? Box Grinder, the image building tool? Yes. Ma Ma Marek, uh, Marek Goldman is using it on OS X, as far as I know. But I don't know how. That's, that's the part. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure about the life. Um, yeah. Like, I will ask and we'll come back. Okay. <laughs> Only useful if you want to build OSX guests, though, in the end. I don't think yeah. you actually can do that legally. Uh, no, 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 no. What do you mean? Build OSX guests. I'm, I'm thinking Linux on OSX. Well, it's got to get the kernel from somewhere. Anyway, let's not dig into that. We need to talk about the uh, the Box grinder or pop 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 pop. That gets there versus ripping it out of uh, Tim directly. Can, 
Jay, you should speak a bit more louder. Francesca, you should speak not so loud. Yeah, just, um, just lean a little closer to the mic, Jay. I'll get, get up, give us that again. I can't really get much closer to the mic, but I'll talk louder. Can you hear Thanks. me better now? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Okay. Maybe get a little closer, we might be able to see your nose hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes! There we go. So, uh, I think the architecture was more that, if anything, if you want to switch out, switch out, up, you can switch out pods, not, not factory. Speak up! It's what we're meant to, to this design work with factory. We built the API with them, specifically work for what we need. And they, have, at least at one point, had, had the, the thought that at some point, uh, if there was a demand or uh, a big enough need, that you could instead of using Oz into some other uh, actual processing system. I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, that, that's how I thought it would work. Uh, that's a desire for, for box breakers to be solved again. Is there some deficiency in factory or Oz that makes people continue to ask this question about whether we could swap it out? <laughs> The only reason I asked was you brought up the question of reusable in other contexts. So I'm thinking if somebody else has a different image building tool they're using already and they want to use yeah. TEM, that was the only reason I asked the question there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's possible that Factory, for example, will use a different backend ultimately for something like Windows in particular. Um, so I think that's probably the point at which we might swap around backends. But in fact, I, obviously, I would have that. Yeah. But, but I guess Factory itself also would not run on OS X, so... It's dependency. Well, Factory itself isn't the one with the problem. It's yeah, it's Oz. Okay, so, so Factory could run on OS X, but there's the Oz problem. And just again, this goes back to the discussion yesterday. Of, you know, the problem. What else would it take to get Aeolus running there? But, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, just to conclude the discussion, uh, I just spoke with Marek and he said that he's not working on OS X. Okay. So, that's it. Marek did his Ruby development on OS X with Fox Strider, so I was front of him most of it on or Rel. Yes, but uh, he's using it on OS X just with uh, a virtual machine. He just pulled it up. Francesco, can you turn down your microphone volume, please? They can't hear you, Justin. Francesco, you should back away from the mic a bit, and uh, everybody else should move closer. All right, but that's enough of that. Carry on, Martin. Yeah, so uh, I think the last point was um, extendability. So um, we basically wanted to essentially conduct it with, was really our main uh, customer for Tim, so we wanted to make sure that it actually worked. Um, I don't know if I did a slide later on on that, but um, when I was talking in a, in a previous slide about um, Rails engines and how they have a dummy app inside, that is, and that's where the tests are run in context of that dummy app. So we essentially uh, cloned uh, all of the classes from Conductor that would, that would potentially um, uh, interact with Tim classes inside Conductor, then we run a bunch of tests to make sure that it was compatible. So, um, so this is basically um, the new um, object model. So, um, and these uh, cross feed lines are one of many relationships. So you can see that the template, even though it doesn't quite make sense um, from the user's perspective, it is the top level object. Um, so um, many base images can have many template, uh, sorry, um, templates can have many base images, uh, base images can have many image versions and so on and so on. So um, we basically interact um, with Image Factory through um, a library that uh, actually lives inside Tim at the moment. Um, it's just an active resource library. Um, and it provides uh, provider and image support. So any of the um, other bits of functionality that uh, Image Factory offers, for example, plugins and for example, base images um, are not currently supported. 
Um, because we didn't really need them in the term, I think Ian mentioned um, when I spoke to him on Friday that there might be some benefit in um, utilising the base image um, object and image factory for some for some uh, um, for some stuff that we're using in the term. Um, and I think he might actually be doing the talk or speaking to us on Google Plus at some point this week. Who's that then? Ian McLeod. Did you get back to Ian on that mic? Oh, no. Cool. no. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, apparently, uh, we didn't let them know. Yeah, Ian, when's your talk? Uh, I, I don't know, I wasn't invited. <laughs> <laughs> Where would you like it to be, Ian? Well, you've got a choice of between, any time between now and um, the end of tomorrow, I guess. Or you could do it Friday afternoon, but no one will be here. <laughs> I thought I'd do it then. But... Excellent. All right, we'll talk later. Did you, did you get an email on that? Have I just dropped them in the talk? I've heard many talks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, sorry about that, Ian. So I just wanted me to talk, but I wasn't formally asked. Oh, all right, okay. Um, yeah, so essentially this needs to be uh, pulled out into a separate project. Um, it could be contributed to the Image Factory project. And if we, if we build this thing out, um, pulled into a, its own gem, um, implemented all of these extra features that Image Factory does, then we'd have quite a nice Ruby library for interacting with Image Factory. Um, so this is essentially um, the interaction between Tim and Image Factory. So we can see that we make um, uh, calls through uh, the Image Factory API to create um, target and provider images. And then, uh, like I said previously, we register a callback um, as part of that request. Um, once the entire image of the provider image is finished building or finished pushing to a particular prior provider, um, then Image Factory will then do a HTTP put um, and put that um, uh, provider image, or target image, um, into Tim um, through Tim's RESTful API. So I've got a little animation, but it's not that obvious. So I essentially wanted to show when the objects are created. Um, so when Tim receives a request um, for a target image, it will then create the target image and save it. So it gets saved in the database at this point. Um, then uh, Tim will then send a request to Image Factory to create a target image. Um, that will go on in the background. Um, Image Factory will uh, send a response with some information such as the ID um, and what the state is, so for in this example it's building and a whole lot of other stuff, but this is the most important stuff. Um, once that's finished building, um, Image Factory will then send a callback through um, Tim's RESTful API um, and then we update, we update the state. So this is um, this essentially is um, a webhook model that we could potentially use in conduct the API. So all the stuff that we were talking about yesterday about um, hooks, yeah. um, you know, we could use this to hook into some workflow engine. Can you get error messages if there's a problem with building through that API as well? Yeah, I think I think we do. Yeah. Um, so no more no looking at logs to see what why you're building yeah. through. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Um, so Tim offers, um, like I said, a REST API. We spent quite a lot, uh, a long time, really uh, trying to nail this because we wanted to get it right. And essentially, what we wanted to do was set the standard for the, the APIs for the rest of the for the engines of the project. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the REST API because we could be here all day. But um, essentially, the entry point to the system is wherever um, Tim's mounted in the host application. Um, in this case, it's mounted at slash Tim. Um, and um, if you do a get on that entry point, then it, it gives you all the, the top level collections. And at that point, then you can discover the rest of the API. Um, one nice thing that we did in Tim um, was we got rid of so this embedded template XML that we had in previous uh, Conductor API, where we had a template <coughs> resource. Yes. And then within that template resource, we had a template description, which is essentially the TDL that um, the factory requires to create 
um, target images. Um, and I wanted to get rid of that, um, that sort of top level template with XML embedded inside it because it just it's messy and it's not particularly easy to use. So we actually just pass in the actual TDL in the Tim now and it will create um, template objects and then it will store the XML as part of that as part of that template object. As you see later on, we want to do things like pass this so we can do like active resource, uh, sorry, active record querying over templates. So if you, you want to do search on, on name, for example, we don't have to pass a lot of XML to, to try and find that. Would it help specifically for this? And there's a, I'm pretty sure there's an XML extension in Postgres. We put stuff in Postgres as XML, and it basically stores it, breaks stuff and stores it as fields. Yeah, that potentially. Yeah. Yeah, stuff. Potentially, yeah. I'm not quite sure how that would integrate with Active Record, yeah. but yeah, that could be one way yeah, to do it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, uh, and on just on that point, it, it's something similar, possibly instead of that, because we were trying to support the database as well, is there may even be some Max Record you know, extension or Rails plugin that does something similar. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so essentially, it's the same as with what um, Richard described earlier in the API. We, um, we reference resources using this um, a resource minimal description. Um, you can have nested resources within any within any description, um, and the idea is really that um, we we initially had um, a requirement to, to do a one uh, request push. I think I'm not sure if that's the <coughs> um, But we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to allow a user to essentially create the whole uh, tree of objects in one single request. Um, so yeah, so. In order to do that, we can, we can define like, a whole nested um, object model. Um, and this is that, essentially. Um, so if you want to create a target image or multiple target images, you can do that in one single request. You, you define a top level object. In this case, like I said previously, a um, template is an underlying model. A template is a top level object because it essentially um, has many base images. But we didn't really want to expose that through the REST API because um, we wanted the user to think that the base image is really the top level object because that's really what makes sense. So in this case, we have a base image with a nested template, so it's a standard uh, template description. We're saying we're going to create um, a single image version, and inside the image version, we've got one target image. Um, and then you basically Post that to the base images API and it'll create the whole, the whole thing for you. We still haven't um, done uh, the one uh, request push yet. Um, we need to do some work to get that work in the image factory. So extending Tim, um, I'm going to skip over this um, actually because uh, we covered this in the Rails Engine talk, but essentially we're just um, open classing. Um, any models that we want to extend, add in any associations that you might want to create with the host application classes, um, and add any um, any methods. So, for example, I know that uh, myself and Scott are talking about um, permissions and those types of things. So, if you wanted to um, add in a list for user, for example, you pass in the user object, and it can return. Uh, a list of image versions that that user has permissions on. Um, controllers. Um, what we recommended with controllers um, when we were integrating with Yarn was um, to use before filters for as much as um, you can because we, we essentially don't want to override Tim's functionality. And you are, you would be doing that if you override if you wrote the methods inside the controllers. So we wanted to um, figure out a way to, for example, find all the image versions that a user has particular permissions on, but we didn't want to um, override Tim's methods to do that. So again, before filters was where we did that. And we can also add um, extra content types um, to the users um, the responder. Uh, pattern. So to add any um, extra content types, you can just define them in the, in the top level control class. 
Um, views. We have a very minimal UI in Tim. The idea is, or at least my um, view of it is that it's really a service and not really um, a user consumable application. Um, so we have a very minimal uh, UI. Um, that potentially could be valuable if we just um, integrate with some of the tools that you were talking about. But um, at the moment our focus is, is, is simply on the API. But you can have, if you wanted to extend our API, you can actually create JSON support, for example, just by dropping those uh, templates in the right directory. Um, <coughs> we were talking um, in the last talk about custom content at the end of XML um, template definitions. And it's a good example of why you might want to do that. So for example, you might want to, the host application might want to add an order um, of a particular image version to the XML output. Um, so rather than overriding the whole XML document, you can just define a custom, um, that's actually underscore custom XML um, template, drop that in the image versions directory, in the image versions directory, and then it will basically render that on the, on the bottom of any image version um, document that gets returned. And this is essential for if we have an upgrade tin, we want to add in, we want to change the API slightly, or we want to change the um, resource, um, definition slightly, um, then conduct doesn't need to worry about that because um, essentially we're just taking what they're defined and adding it down to the template. Um, we talked about responders as well in the last talk. In turn, this is one of the things that we needed to do to get the API to behave how we wanted to. Um, so we overrode basically the API behavior method and the um, action controller responder. Um, and then we set this custom responder in our application controller. So essentially here we're rendering um, the show view rather than um, what the default was, which I can't remember. Um, but this is the way that we expect um, the HTML behavior to change in Conductor. So for example, um, if you needed to, uh, you, you wanted to, the redirection to be slightly different to what's in Tim. If um, you wanted to render a slightly different page, then you would essentially define that in the custom responder, which essentially allows you to define behavior for a particular format without having to um, alter the uh, controllers. Um, so we've still got a little bit of work to do. Um, We talked about in the last talk about some of the problems with um, Rails REST API. And we have some custom code in Tim that manages that. So we have um, basically we have a default filter <coughs> that takes um, the proper um, XML representation, converts it into what Rails expects, and then uses the Rails helper methods to create the objects. Um, it would be quite nice if we could pull that out and then maybe create a gem that we could share across different engines so we don't have to keep replicating this. We'd also like to, to have um, further image factory integration. Um, we'd like to extend the image factory gem. Um, if we could, it'd be quite nice to contribute that to the image factory project if we can get that finished off. And like I said earlier, um, <coughs> there, there might be some potential for using the space image object in image factory. Um, we still need to do the one request push. We can actually do the one request build actually, just the push that we need to do. We don't have any, we have a very minimal and untested UI at the moment, so it would be quite nice to offer something there. We still need to support image importing. Um, template passing again, what I was talking about for doing querying. And then basically any requirements that come up with Conductor. So it's the first time that we've actually created an engine, the first time that we've integrated an engine with any proper um, application. So you know, every now and again, Conductor guys come to us and say, well, this doesn't work quite as we expected it. So that's an ongoing process that we have. So that's it. Um, any questions? Say why? Is there a say why? You've got a UI? Like yeah. So, no, there isn't. Okay. Um, Can you plan? Well, I think the work that, essentially that API 
is um, will be exposed in Kondunta. And the work um, so was the was the UI. Yeah. Why is that the UI? Yeah, if you, I mean, you're saying that it's basically going to be consumed by conductor, which is going to do the front end. Yeah, yeah. So, so there isn't a UI. So, so oh, yeah. Right, so right, right. essentially, it's just a service at the moment. But I said, as a standalone component, okay. like outside a conductor, it might be worthwhile implementing the UI. Uh, and we, we actually probably, there has to be a CLI because this actually is the only part in 1.0 that has a CLI. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's, it's always going to have to replace it. CLI work with that? Yes. So, that's, that's, yeah. so the idea is that this API that we've created, you can mount inside Conductor and use the Conductor or AOLIS CLI. So the work mm -hmm. that Richard's doing at the moment with the CLI, but essentially talk to this API. Yeah. But possibly you can use that even if, even if you're using this code elsewhere, not in conductor, um, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, potentially. I would think we want to be able to, uh, we want to be able to chop off the bit of the CLI that would work with the with Tim by itself. Yeah. Because um, I, think, I think that's something that people are going to want. Yeah. I hope it's something they want. Yeah. Well, really, that shouldn't like it shouldn't be much work to do that. I wouldn't have thought the way that the new CLI is going to be structured it should be reasonably easy to pull out a portion of that and create. Next, next bullet as well. But it sounds like between Richard's conductor API and the rest of stuff that you've got there, a person could actually go in and do a bunch of querying because. The conductor API, at the moment, my understanding is, doesn't cover much of the image type stuff, whereas this would. Well, this would be included. I mean, I mean, it's 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 eventually, eventually, yeah. yeah. But in, in the short term, yeah. to actually do. But I mean, even in the short term, the thing is, because it's an engine, we're not. It's just not a separate application. So when conductor yeah. includes that, yeah. then the conductor API will include ten API as part of it. Yeah, I think I'm just not yeah. quite getting the whole. Yeah. 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 All good. Any more questions? Okay, I think that's it. Has anybody got any questions on Google Hangout? Nope. Oh, well, I, I do have one, actually. I, I know you don't have an exact timeline, but when do you think ballpark this will be live in Conductor? I think we're aiming for 2.0, is that right, Mike? Nope. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Um, let me ask you one other yeah. question, sorry. <laughs> um, I would think we have, hopefully, have an upstream release of it before then, right? That is the hope, yes. Yeah. Yeah, like, I'd like I mean, to see it. There's integration ongoing right now. Yeah. And it's already packaged up as a gem, and it's already in the uh, root gem now. Um, how quickly can we get it into conductor as opposed to how much is available? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see really like to see an upstream release before the end of the year and I'd like this to be in it. Whether we actually make that happen or not, I don't know, but that's my my personal goal. Right. Um, Maybe yeah, one more, uh, also this stupid question. Uh, what's the semantics behind having uh, more base images for one template? Um, because, well, the way that we, we thought it would work is essentially you user would upload a template um, and then you can use that template to create um, many different base images. Um, so for example, um, uh, me as a template creator might up create a template and then lots of different users can then use that template to create their own images. Uh, what about on the current model where when you, when, you, when you have a base image and you go to make a new version of it, you actually upload a new, new template for that version? Um, so in the current model, then you actually could have more than one template for, you know, again, each each image version could have its own template. No, so I mean that that's that's the one model. I know you're. All right, yeah, yeah. So at the moment, that's so is now. that functionality lost now? What what happens again? What is the use case of? I've already built my you know one version of this yeah. JBoss server. I now go and I make a new version. I upload a new template, but I want it to be the same you know base image. Yeah, so um, at, the, at this moment in time it's implemented, so the template is, is unchangeable for the base image. But in future iterations we'll probably have to have some um, 
pointer in the image version that points to the, the exact template that, that, was, that those images were built from at some point. Um, I think actually, if, when I pulled this original um, model out of the image warehouse, yeah. that we, the uh, template was associated with the target image. Yeah. So we'll move that to image version, and then we can you can you can, um, you can, you can guarantee that that's going to be uh, anything underneath that will be. Yeah, and image version to me seems like there was a logical list for that, but um, and you know, but yeah, you know, because it's the base image that that makes it harder to handle that kind of case of. You know, yeah. and I'm gonna I'm going to edit the template because yeah. I screwed something up and I need a new version. Yeah. Also, um, the way that it's implemented at the moment is that templates are immutable, so you can't um, update them. If I remember rightly, port is uh, undefined for template. Yeah. And since you've got deployables that reference image base images, it's it's really important, I think, to be able to update to a new template and do a new build. Yeah. That existing deployables pointing to that base image will now point to the updated one. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, that's something that probably will be happening for the 1 to 2.0 time frame. Is it a conductive requirement? I, I don't know. It just seems like a regression to me that we're losing yeah, the ability yeah. to do that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's something that we could do. Um, so if you guys think that's going to be valuable, yeah. then we'll Well, to me, it seems like otherwise, the way the model is now, once I publish an image, I can never change that template ever without starting over and then having that every single deployable point to that new image. Well, yeah. You're around it without changing the model. Everybody hear me this time? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you can get around that without changing the model that we have. Uh, you might just want to add a little bit of uh, workflow where if you want to create, say, your example, Scott, of a new version of the template, it still needs to be a new template because that old version needs Exactly, but it's the same base image with a new image version. Right, so all, all that would have to do uh, potentially is uh, add reference to the newer version of the template. So you could, you could uh, take the existing template, use that, that information to create the new uh, changed one, and then associate that with your uh, base image that you already have. Or, or your image version, actually, because you need to know which, because if you have the image version 1 and image version 2, you need to be able to know from your model which template was used for image version 1, which was used for image version 2. Well, I think there's two cases. There's, there's, a, there's an update case where you're rebuilding off the base image, but what you're talking about, you're creating a new image. No, no, same base image, but a new image version. Right, but if you're changing the template, you have different things on it. You're not just updating and rebuilding. It's not the same thing. Right, and I mean, I know it's a new, it's a new, it's a new template. It's a new, but, but I, again, I'm just thinking of a use case of I got, I've got this, you know, deployable with you know three instances, three, three images in it, and I want to update one of those, you know, with a new build with a new template, um, with the same base image ID, so that the people can automatically, you know, the deployables automatically get. In my mind, what that would mean would mean a new image version with a new template object, um, but it's the same base image. At least that's the way it would have worked in 1.0. Are you talking about actually making changes about what's installed in that image? Yeah, I mean, I mean, upload a new template, you know, the new, a new XML template sort of definition. Right, oh, you know, you know, it's, it's, instead of... Two different things. We could do that. We can work through how to handle that, but I think that's two different things. If you're, you're, you're combining rebuilding or, or you know, making, making a, a new image because there's some updates that you want to make and you've got the same base template describing it versus making a change to the template and then rebuilding from that. Oh yeah, it's definitely a different use case. In one case, you don't need a new template. And, when, and then that, I'm talking about the case where you do edit a template. Um, right. I'm just saying, there are two different pieces. You don't want to lose the original template. Um, right, right, exactly. No, no. That, that, that's why I'm thinking image version might be a good place to. It was since later, and this is not really. I understand what he's trying to say. Let's okay. talk about it um, at some point during this week. Maybe yeah. I should bring up one other thing that you guys may or may not be aware of, which is that in an upcoming Catello version, not all that long from now, yeah. um, they will have a feature called content views. The content view is a tightly versioned repository. In other words, every package in the repository is tracked 
and if you reference a particular content view, you can be guaranteed that the bits in that content view haven't changed over time. Mm -hmm. This is a new, it's a new Catello feature. You can't do that with an ordinary Yum repo. It's kind of like a snapshot when it's on here. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, you could also, the, the, the real use case for it is um, a content manager could decide they're going to change one package yeah. in a content view and represent that this is, this is now content view with one bug fix. Nothing else has changed. And you could then decide, okay, I'm going to go rebuild all of these, all of the images that were based on this thing. Or if I want to add a new image, I can still be confident that the bits are the same. Was that essentially what Icicles built on originally? It kind of was, yeah. But there was never any way to support it yeah. because we didn't have a version repository support. And right. we will now have version repository Because yeah, without a version repository, the problem is once the group replay changes, you have no way of rebuilding yeah. right. with the same packages. So that, that's something we're going to want to be able to take into account at some point. I don't know if it has a direct effect on Tim, but it's a, it's a useful um, concept anyway. Anybody have anything else? All right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks.